Can everybody stand for the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Kirk, take the roll. O'Connor? Here. Morissette? Here. Alms? Here. McCormick? Here. Weber? Here. Hoggett? Here. Paul? Here. Okay, uh, before we do the comments and suggestions from citizens, we do have a uh, swearing in of an officer that we'd like to get into the agenda. Chief, if you would. Thank you, sir. Uh, officer Anthony, Jeff Gary, one more, please. And here's Chris. Come on up. I'm knock something over, I know. <laughs> You want to raise your right hand, please? A repeat after me. I, Luke Radke. I, Luke Radke. Having been appointed as patrol officer. Having been appointed as patrol officer. For the City of Hudson Police Department. For the City of Hudson Police Department. Affirm that I will support. Affirm that I will support. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And the Constitution of the State of Wisconsin. And will faithfully and impartially. And will faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties of said office. Discharge the duties of said office. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. Officer Radke comes from us from three different departments. One of it is his Prescott. This is one of his fellow officers, Chris Stewart, who said he wanted to come up and poke him. I mean, pin his badge on him. That's why he's wearing his vest tonight. Um, he's originally from Stoughton, I believe. So he's been part-time with us since the summer. And when we hired him on December 9th, he just started right off. We didn't even have to put him through field training because he'd already been through it. So he's been working a month already. He's doing a fantastic job. So congratulations. Thank you, sir. We'll All right. You. portion of the agenda for citizen comments. Anybody have anything they would like to say? Please step forward, identify yourself. Good to see you. Come on in. Ruth Peterson, Hudson Hot Air Fair, 735 11th Street South here in Hudson. Um, I'm here to represent the 29th year of the Hudson Hot Air Fair. Our theme this year is Touchdown Hudson, XX1X, which means 29. And we've moved the date to January 26th, 27th, and 28th because of the Super Bowl in Minneapolis. We do have some pre-events this year. Um, we have the Candlelight Ski on January 13th. We have Crafts for Kids at Dick's on the 20th. We have Family Day activities at the Phipps Center also on the 20th of January. On um, Friday the 26th, we, we start the event. We have a parade. We have school programs also during that day. On Saturday, we have two balloon launches, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. We have a 5K race in the morning. We have a marketplace and craft fair up at the EP Rock School. We have two sessions of bingo this year also. We have the Taste of Hot Air Fair, a fundraiser for the American Cancer Society. On uh, Saturday night, we have the Moon Glow or the Field of Fire. And then on Sunday, we have the balloon launch again. And also on Sunday, we have the Kids Fishing Derby and we have a new event, which is a, a hot dish contest uh, that's going to be sponsored by the winery here downtown, and it should be kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have posters here. We do have brochures, the posters, brochures, the sponsor signs will be distributed to the uptown businesses and the businesses downtown in the next few days. Um, I'd also like to thank the City of Hudson, our sponsors, our partners, our volunteers, for the support of the Hot Air Fair for 2018. You can check the website for updates on balloon launches, for information on the schedule, um, and like I said, the brochures will be out. Again, I'd like to thank you, the city, and 
the city of Hudson and the residents of Hudson and welcome everyone to come out to the hot air fair on January 26th, 27th, and 28th. Thank you, Ruth. Anybody? Thank Any you. questions? Oh, I guess we can't do that, can we? Thank you, Ruth. Anybody else? Any other comments? Any other comments? Any other comments? Close that portion of the agenda. And move on to the consent agenda. To approve the regular meeting minutes of December 4th, 2017 and the special meeting minutes of December 7th, 2017. To approve claims in the amount of $813,142.28. Contingent on payment of any outstanding debt owed to the city and successful completion of the background check. To approve the issuance of three regular operator licenses for the period of January 9th, 2018 to June 30th, 2019. To Kendall uh, Tyranny, McKenna Anderson, and Alexandra Delahouse. To place on file the December 12th, 2017 Public Utility Commission meeting minutes. And to approve the secondhand jewelry dealer license to David Inlow, Inlow Designs for a period from January 9th, 2018 to December 31st, 2018 subject to the standard background check and payment of any outstanding debt owed to the city. Move for approval. Second. Uh, motion is second for approval. Roll call. Uh, Morissette. Yes. Alms. Yes. McCormick. Yes. Weber. Yes. Hoggett. Yes. Hall. Yes. Motion is approved. Uh, update uh, 2018 Street Improvements, Hanley Road, uh, Carmichael Road to Heritage Boulevard. Tom. Um, the item tonight is uh, a discussion again as you mentioned it's an update uh, there's no council action that's actually needed or required tonight what I thought I'd do is just give a, a brief background of the project uh, what has happened in the past to get us to where we are tonight and then the next step and Glenn Van Warmer from uh, Short Alley to Hendrickson is here tonight if there's some specific questions or concerns uh, we could we could have uh, Glenn address those as he was the one that uh, did the traffic and uh, traffic analysis traffic study. Um, basically, going back to May last spring, uh, city was and received a letter from the Red Cedar Canyon uh, Association uh, Residents Association uh, expressing some safety and traffic concerns on Hanley Road. Some of the items that were brought up uh, and mentioned. Uh, the existing trails and sidewalks, the pedestrian crossings, uh, there was some discussion about turn lanes, uh, relative uh, volume of truck traffic, uh, the Carmichael Road intersection at Hanley was, was brought up, and then uh, potholes were mentioned. So those were just some of the items mentioned, again, relative to safety and traffic concerns. Um, those issues were discussed at public safety committee meetings both uh, in May and October. Uh, Hanley Road was selected as part of the 2018 improvement project, which is basically a mill and overlay type projects for the 2018 uh, season. Um, due to these safety concerns, the council authorized Short Elliott Hendrickson to do a traffic study to address some of these issues on November 6th. Uh, there was a special council meeting that was held on December 7th in which Glenn from Short Elliott Hendrickson presented um, some alternates and some options to the design. And uh, again, that was a special meeting to discuss that, that traffic study. At the conclusion of that meeting, the council decided to implement the three-lane design. Uh, as you know, High Hanley Road currently is a four-lane, 52-foot wide roadway and again the council direction at the end of that meeting was to implement a three-lane design so where where we sit actually tonight and as far as what next step would be it would be at the next council meeting january 22nd we would bring the plans to you for a council approval of those plans and specifications and getting an authorization to put the advertise, advertisement for bid in the paper in other words to start the bidding process with that, uh, if there are some questions, again, Glenn's here, and he was the one that uh, did the study in the previous presentation uh, back on the 7th of December. Any questions? Anybody? Anybody? 
it's my understanding that there might be some people here from uh, from over uh, Red Cedar Canyon or Heritage Green that might have a comment. Is there anything anybody would like to say? Sure, come on up. Identify yourself, please. Give your address. Doug Rowan, 295 Riverview Drive. At the last public discussion of this project, there was a request that the local businesses, Uline, GM, and the um, residents be at least talked to to see what their feedback was on the proposed plan, and I didn't hear any of that tonight. Tom? Yes, we did hear that there are potentially some questions relative to this design or change or this implementation of this three lane design. So we did send out uh, somewhere in the 80 to 90 letters to all the business park, the businesses north and south of Hanley Road down towards Pearson Drive and Maxwell Drive. Those letters went out about 10 days ago that pretty much referenced some of the background uh, that I gave you in the introduction, as well as tonight's meeting that if anyone, they were invited to attend, if anyone had any additional concerns, any additional questions. Again, and that went out, I believe, about 10 days ago. And I have not received any response. None? Really? None. Okay. Thanks. One any thing I should throw out to <coughs> Typically on these, you know, we've done these annual improvement projects and typically we do have a public meeting prior to construction. Usually that's when, uh, after we open bids and when we know who the contractor that's going to do the work, uh, we know at that time who that is. And we've had public meetings in the past. So we have that uh, going forward, which would take place following the bids. And then we know, uh, assuming the council goes forward with that bid, then we'd know who the contractor is and have a, an opportunity for that public meeting. And we've done that each and every year so far. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Any comments on this? Yes, Marion. Marion Weber, 604 Grandview Drive. And I'm just speaking on behalf of the bicyclists. And I'm um, president of River Valley Trails. I'm also a member of the Hudson Bicycle Advisory Committee. And uh, I don't have any, I think that we're going to be able to work through and, and make this an improved uh, way for bicyclists to use the road also. It's a very popular road for road bicyclists, not so much for the casual bicyclists because it's a big hill. But if there were some sort of an accommodation on the right-hand side of the road for the uh, road cyclists because... When, you, when you when you say right hand, north I mean or south? The south side. I'm going up the hill now, yep. but on the uphill portion, if there were some sort of accommodation for bicyclists, that would be great. And actually, on uh, coming down the hill, on the south, on the north side, uh, bikes are the road bikes are probably going to be going as fast as the cars, so it's not as much of a concern. But for the safety of the bicyclists, it'd be nice to have some sort of accommodation on the right hand side of the road. Also, I um, all right. I, talked a little bit with a gentleman who are working on this project and and um, there's a the path there as it is is not adequate to support a multi-use multi-usage like for the bicycles walkers uh, skaters um, moms and dads pushing things if someone's on a wheelchair uh, that path isn't adequate to support all those usages and and uh, and it wouldn't even begin to meet ADA requirements. But uh, it also would be nice if at some point we could address that path. And I understand that that's not really a part of this project. This is strictly about the road. But in the future, it would be very nice to have that addressed as a improvement that could be made to make it safer and, and uh, more friendly for all of the citizens to use. And it's not. I just want to interject it. It's not something that the road bicyclists would be welcome on because they go too fast. It would be dangerous. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay. Um, any comment here? Yeah, I'm surprised there were no comments. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no response from uh, the park and yeah. Interesting. All right, uh, Tom. One last thing. 
We did have a, an email from the, I'm not sure if it was the president of going out of the association or the new president coming in that did have an email and Glenn did respond to that, I think a week ago. That is the one response that I know that did go out. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know, Bill, whether it's the incoming it was or the, the outgoing incoming. or one of the presidents of the homeowners association. Okay. I think that was before the notice came out that you replied to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? All right, we'll move on. Uh, presentation of the Carmichael Road Corridor Study. I know it's not going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> I could just show this and try to move as fast as your finance committee, but I don't think that that would be beneficial to the group. <laughs> uh -oh. It says there's a newer version available. Yeah, but that's not. Okay. Oh, I know where to go. I'm sorry. Somehow it got disconnected here. This reminds me of the good old days at 3M when we first started using computers <laughs> and uh, you had to have an IT guy in the room to use a computer for a presentation. You did not dare start up without that. It's hard to change it. And faxing too. <laughs> you have to fax your own documents. I guess. <laughs> That just kind of blew my mind. So what do you mean I can't use my own facts? <laughs> yeah, me too. He knows I'm a dinosaur, so he's standing right next to me to help me out anytime something goes wrong. <laughs> I'll try and be I'll try and give you the reader's digest version of what we had at the public hearing or at the public meeting earlier today. Uh, since you've been around the Carmichael Road, I don't need to repeat some of the concerns that people had, uh, but if you've been on it, you see all of these as concerns, turning movement volumes, uh, inconsistencies in lanes, and, and just not a lot of alternate routes. The timeline, in 2009, the comprehensive plan said Carmichael Road was a problem and suggested that you work on it right away. We did some sketches, those went to WSDOT, uh, we had a meeting with WSDOT and suggested an origin destination study, which they did in 2011. Uh, got some very good information on that. They did an interchange study in 2014, and that's the one that you've seen as a preferred alternate. The council approved that. And now we've got a corridor study. So the city's been doing things in Carmichael for quite some time. The study basically tried to establish a base traffic volume for all of the intersections in the whole corridor, and then come up with a traffic forecast for two future years, 2025, which is when much of the immediate development in the in Carmichael Ridges and, and St. Croix Meadows would be done, and then 2040, which is the normal 20 plus year uh, timeline that you use. We verified the land use planning with Mike. Uh, we, we're using the preferred alternate in our, our simulation programs. Uh, and we're going to also come up with a traffic signal coordination plan, which is it's a little separate from this. We've got a lot of volumes that are available from the WSDOT uh, count programs, developer studies. Uh, I've got a briefcase that's probably half full of traffic counts and all of which we've gotten daily and hourly volumes. So there's a significant amount of data there. But the volumes are 34,000 just south of the 94 interchange and drops down about 8,800 when you get down to Albert Street. So there's a lot of turning traffic in between. 
what we, I'm going to skip a couple of these. What we've done for traffic volume data use is we've created tables for each count location for 17 years and traced and see how the pattern is for growth. And we also went down each roadway, Carmichael and some of the cross streets, and again tried to create to see if the patterns are, are consistent. So what we are shooting for is not just grabbing a couple of numbers and saying that's it, but make sure that we've got numbers that are reasonable for all of the movements, all of the intersections in the uh, entire corridor. We also try to find out where drivers are headed. There's three ways to do that. One is for the new development to go into a trip generation. Uh, we can go to turning the trip generation. Uh, we've got a th huge three volume set of studies that have been done on all different kinds of land uses. So we can figure out how many trips are gonna come from a convenience store of 30,000 square feet. A single family dwelling unit will give you so many trips per day and <coughs> you get peak hours and directions. So it's just a wealth of traffic volume information, plus the census data gives us some information. Turning movements are another thing that we can use because you can look at the left turns, right turns, and through movements at an intersection, look at a couple, look at the cross streets, and see if they're consistent. If you have 20,000 cars and you have 4,000 on the cross streets and you only have 10,000 south of there is a problem, we have to go back in and adjust that. The origin destination study is, is pretty thorough. They counted 36 locations for 16 straight days. So we have a ton of daily traffic volumes. Uh, what they use is a Bluetooth technology, which means they, anybody that had a Bluetooth phone and drove up a ramp went through a Bluetooth, through one of the recording stations, if they went up the westbound off ramp. If it sh they showed up again on Crestview west of Carmichael Road, we knew the origin and the destination in general terms. And we had enough connections of Bluetooth vehicles and, and handheld devices that they got a reasonable number and were able to trace it and develop all kinds of tables and even some, some volume information on how much traffic will go. As an example, if somebody came up that ramp and crossed, or if this is for some, from south and north, if somebody went through Crestview at Gateway and, and passed that, if we knew that that's where they originated, if they then showed up the second time on the bridge, we knew that that was a trip into Minnesota. And you could do that with all of those areas. It's uh, pretty remarkable that all they have to do is collect information on the side of the road. Uh, rather than stop motors and find out, ask them where they were going, where they came from, et cetera, and then do all the hand tabulation. Pretty reliable. WSDOT studied the whole 94 corridor. Uh, they focused on a Carmichael interchange. Uh, they did forecasts. Uh, the forecast showed in the year 2012 a certain volume, and, and for example, the far left side shows the volume at the bridge at 77,000 in 2012, and by 2035, it's gonna be 134,000. Now, it doesn't mean they're all coming from Hudson, but if you go th back to what we did and, and start from the year 2000, or even further back, you can see how it just keeps building out. Uh, the traffic growth now is out in the Baldwin area. That's where the 94 traffics are going up. But we also have that for ramps and for a lot of other locations. They also did, some forecasts for ramps and for the Carmichael interchange. The one that you want to look at is the eastbound off-ramp, which shows right now there were 13,000 in 2012, but they're forecasting 14,300. Well, they used a, a little more general forecast where they took a volume and made a percent increase per year. What we've done is taken the actual development, St. Croix Meadows and the actual Carmichael Ridges, and then assigned volumes to some of the other development, the areas open for development, so we could get a very accurate count. And the number is gonna be higher than that, which is astounding for a ramp. I don't have to go through the interchange. I think you're all familiar with uh, what the preferred alternate is. But the thing it does very nicely is gets rid of a lot of the left turning traffic in the bridge area. You convert two of them to right turns on the loops. And so, it, it, and we also eliminate a couple of intersections in the middle, which are now become uh, right turn only intersections. 
this is the one that uh, is probably causing the most concern, and that's the cost that they estimated at 25 to 30 million and requires right away primarily in the northeast quadrant. Future land use, uh, we used a comprehensive plan. We further looked at certain areas and put most of those areas in as a specific development or as a land use generating certain volumes of traffic. So what we have, I think, is some pretty accurate future trip information in the corridor. Some of the other ones, like the business park and the area south of uh, Cooley Trail, uh, those are going to have a small increase in traffic because there's not much in the volume, much in land left in the the uh, business park, and so we let that go into what we call a, a background growth. Uh, so we've accounted for all of the vacant land through either background growth or through specific assignment of trip generation to a, a type of land use. We can do, do a lot with trips from new development in terms of, of how many trips are coming out and we've, we can ignore some of them because there are people who, uh, if you're in a, the St. Croix Meadows development and you're in an office, you make a trip to go to the restaurant but it's in the same thing, same development, it doesn't go out on the road, we, we discount those. So we're making a, adjustments for those types of trips. The forecast components that we have are the existing volumes, uh, which we changed all of those so they're equivalent to 2017 and they are all balanced so that all the way up and down the corridor you had some system so that the traffic leaving Cooley Road going south was the same as we for, as the volumes we used at the north ramp, et cetera, all the way up and down from Vine all the way down to Hanley. Uh, specific development volumes, the vacant lands, and then the background growth. For distribution of traffic, you know, who went which way, we had the origin destination data, we have existing traffic patterns, uh, we've got uh, market land, market uh, areas for land uses, uh, we know what the market area for the ball field would be and that's different from the market area for the restaurant in that development. And so we, we make adjustments for the types of traffic coming out of there as to where they're going. In other words, we'd have more traffic going to Interstate 94 from the ballpark, a higher percentage of their trips than we would from the restaurant because they would come from generally the same area, the Hudson area. The computer model that we have uh, basically takes all of those, uh, gives us an output. The output is kind of mind-boggling in some ways. Uh, this is just one sheet of several that we get. It shows an intersection oh, under each of the conditions so we can see how much traffic was there, how much traffic comes from background growth in terms of all of the different directions. Question is, does it work? We can't tell that from just those numbers, but we can do uh, a simulation, uh, yeah, traffic measurement, which is also a simulation program, where we assess the level of service, but we also use the length of the backups, the how much delay there is, to try to assess how well the intersection is working. It's just like school. <coughs> and a through A and B are pretty darn good. C is desirable, D is acceptable. That's what you're running in a lot of the major roadways in the metropolitan area is D. Uh, e means that uh, you're gonna have stop and go traffic, and F means you're just not gonna go anywhere. Uh, the example I used earlier is when you drive from here to Woodbury in the rush hour in the morning, you're probably in level of service D because you're, you're, you're flowing with whoever else is on the road with you. You don't have much freedom to move. When some clown runs off the road, you immediately go to level of service E and F because you just can't get the traffic past them. You stop and go. And so if you see an F, you know that the traffic has failed. We have some other printouts. Uh, they're a little mind-boggling in a way, uh, but they, they show up in red whenever we have a level of service F, and they show up in yellow when we have a level of service E. This is the first run-through of the 2025 traffic volume PM peak hour uh, for, with the new alternate for the interchange. And we got some red marks up there. We think we can get some of those red marks to go away with some simple lane changes like adding the left turn lane down on, on Hanley at Carmichael 
Uh, the Vine Street one is a little bit uh, because of the lane arrangements that you have up there. You don't have left and right turn lanes, you, you know, so you, you're missing some movements and uh, it's, it's a little hard to run a high volume of traffic through it. The one that's concerning is the eastbound off ramp that I pointed out earlier with 13, 14, 15,000 cars. That's huge for an off ramp. And that's the one that is bothering us the most. The simulation that we have, and I'll show you that, an example, and that's the one that brought up most of the questions in the uh, public meeting. It provides a visual of this traffic flow. If you were a kid and you had an ant farm, you watched those ants crawl around in there, but well, we do it only with, with vehicles. And uh, it gives us an opportunity to see where the traffic is going and how the intersections interact between each other and lets us uh, try some different ideas and see well, what, what's that change make. I'll give you an example in, in a little bit. The conclusion we've got so far is that with the anticipated traffic that you'll have by 2025, you're going to need to, the preferred alternate. We didn't even run it with the existing because the preferred alternate was running with level of service F on that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> on the off ramp with only the right turn traffic there. If we had to put the left turn traffic back on the eastbound off ramp, it would be way into level of service F. Uh, Carmichael Road to the north, north of Culver's in that area, north of uh, Walgreens, needs at least two lanes in each direction, the left turn lanes. I mean, we've, we've seen that coming for some time. You have, you've preserved the right of way for it. Um, so it, it's, it's going to happen, but that'll probably happen with the development as uh, the open spaces north of Culver's and on the east side start to, to go. Vine Street at Carmichael needs improvements beyond just trying to paint in a turn lane or something. Uh, the good news is that except for that eastbound off ramp, the interchange works okay. The bad news is if there's one thing that WSDOT will look at, it's that westbound or the eastbound off ramp. And so we have to somehow get it to operate better than it is or WSDOT is going to uh, ask for something different. And any additional growth beyond 2025 and there isn't a lot left after you've developed the GOG track and the golf course and uh, the old rest area and a few other areas. The only one that we don't have a lot of traffic coming out of is the northeast quadrant. And so what goes in the northeast quadrant is going to be the biggest concern after 2025. A couple of general comments. The levels of service are really weren't unexpected. Uh, we saw some of that. Uh, and well, we see some of it today, and we know even in the future that the, the, vamp, the volumes are going to grow up. The St. Croix Meadows study, when uh, that was concluded, they said that the preferred alternate would need, be needed by stage three in their development. Uh, they couldn't get it to work either. The WSDOT traffic forecast that uh, you had with their plan, their preferred alternate, that in, did not include the detailed development in the St. Croix Meadows or in the, the uh, Carmichael Ridges. They just had a general growth rate, which didn't include that intensive development on those two properties. And uh, we've, we know in going back through here that some of those, we can change some things, but we're not going to be able to make adjustments to get everything to work, and we know it's not going to work, and without that in, uh, other the alternate. But there's some planning that's gone into these things already. Uh, the Hanley project that you approved is going to add that left turn lane on westbound Hanley at Carmichael, which will take care of some of the problems. That was pointed out in the St. Croix Metal Study, too. Hillcrest Drive at Carmichael Road worked with the developer there, and when the road is expanded so that we can add some extra lanes, all we need to do is take out the south curb. You don't have to rebuild anything other than the south curb in there. So we've set it up for the future wider road on the north section. The last thing I want to quickly go through is signal coordination. Uh, everybody says the signal coordination out there doesn't work because with signal coordination, you should get green lights as you proceed through. Uh, if you go in on uh, 
on Highway 65 north of the cities or some of the city streets in Woodbury, you'll see that as you drive along, you get a green light and about the time you get to an intersection, you get another green and so on. It's really easy to do if you're all going in one direction because we just set it up. If you got it going in two directions, well then we got to try and get the queue from the one side and the queue from the other side to meet at intersections. The closer spacing of the intersections, the harder it is to get that to work. The higher volumes you have that are entering at those intersections and turning, the harder it is to get to work. And the higher <coughs> overall volumes you got, the harder it is to get to work. And all those are present. So what you have is something that's really, really, really hard to get to work. We have, in the simulation that I'll show you, we got a coordinated system for both directions with the new interchange. We haven't tried it on the old one, but we will. We'll do, a, and the other thing is the current system right now is not really functioning. You have the two ramps that are coordinated. They both belong to MnDOT or WSDOT. You have uh, Crestview that sometimes is coordinated, but it's got some little problems in the system and its timing so that it kicks itself out of the coordination system. So if somebody's saying, well, I don't have a coordinated system going through Hanley and Center and Crestville, that's because it's not hooked up. But we'll get that hooked up as part of our, our project. Uh, the next steps that we have is to use a simulation program to refine that operation. Uh, we know where there are some options for improvements, but we are still got some that we don't know what to do with. Um, we're also going to try and develop some concepts beyond what you have out there uh, in the interchange, maybe to improve that level of service so you don't have to worry about after 2025. Uh, once we get this done and the city is comfortable with it, we'll go to MidDOT or WISDOT and start working with them to see if they first they will accept what we've got and then what they would be willing to work with in terms of construction improvements, et cetera. But we will implement a coordination system for the in-place roadway. And with that, we'll put a simulation program up there, and that will be kind of interesting. I shouldn't say we, I say you will put it up there. This is an interesting uh, use of the computer and of all the work that we have put into it. This is 2025 with the preferred alternate interchange PM peak hour. This is the existing off ramp eastbound Crestview. Uh, we, we're only interested in the simulation program with what's in the corridor and not with what's going on out in the, the outside area. So this, this doesn't, don't pay any attention to that. But you can see the backup of traffic and the slowdown that are occurring in it off ramp, even though we have a long green light to get them on Carmichael Road. And you can't count them, but there's about 13 or 14,000 cars a day going on that. It's a huge number in the PM peak hour. The traffic going north goes around a loop on the east side of the interchange and then makes a right turn with a traffic signal to go north on Harmony. If I were taller, I could show you what's going on on the other interchange on the other side. But you can see also the off-ramp that now aligns with Cooley 
and you see the on-ramp is strictly a right turn. We've got a high volume of left turning traffic on and off the ramp up at the coulee and the off-ramp intersection. But what this, some of the things it showed us is that there's a lot of traffic that comes off the ramp and goes south and then immediately turns and goes on the crest view. And that's what shows up in the uh, forage and destination study also. So what we can do with this is try to play with lanes, add a lane here, make a double turn lane where there's only a single, although we've got mostly doubles in there already. Uh, maybe even try to redirect the traffic, but there's only a limit to what we can do with it. But it does give us a lot of opportunities to, to look at the traffic and try to visualize what else can be done. But if you see that picture of the off-ramp with that backup in a constant flow, it's going to be difficult to, to move a lot more traffic on that. So I'm, uh, we've gone way past the finance committee's limit on time. I apologize for that. On the other hand, I got a few more problems on the finance committee with this. <laughs> yeah. So with that, I'll, I that, try, just tried to bring you up to date. We we'll probably have a, uh, another month's worth of work to do. But are there, do you have questions? Do you have comments? Are there extra concerns? Yeah, I have a question for you, Glenn. Uh, do I understand from what you said that WizDOT underestimated the traffic count? They, they uh, underestimated because they didn't see they didn't have the St. Croix Meadows or the Carmichael Ridges in uh, the intensity of the development in their mind. And how much, uh, what percentage difference is that? Uh, well, their 2035 forecast was probably 10,000 less than ours. So what's that, 25% or? Well, 10,000 and 35,000. Uh, we we're, we're estimating about 50,000 cars a day here, and I think they had 35 or 38,000. But we're, we had a little different time frame. So what, uh, how does that affect the plan that they presented? Well, uh, that's a good question. That's why we're looking at some different options to try to figure out can we, can we do more. I think they used their at the time they did that was, 19, was 2015, 2014 was the actual study, and 13 was when they did the analysis. They didn't have some of these, these developments that we now know exist. So are you going to work with WizDOT to give them this information so that they come up with a revised plan, or how, what's going to happen? I think we would probably try to come up with ideas, but not spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to get the ideas to work. But we, we don't want to go spend too much time with them until we're comfortable with all of the elements that went into this as a city. I mean, this is an expensive project, right? It's 25 million or 30 million? They said 20 to 25 million, and that was back in 2014. So it's going to be more by 2025, probably. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, got an idea, Tom? More. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, I got two questions. One, I'm back to the signaling coordination. Yes. You're saying that that has not been working or has not been in sync as of how long? I don't know, but we, were in, we went into all of the cabinets and picked up the information on what the equipment's there and what timing was set up so that we could run the model. And uh, our guy went in there and said, there's only two of them that are hooked up to run full time, and that's the two ramp signals. And they put in two new, inter two new controllers in their cabinets a couple of years ago. Now, why would it be that way? It should have been hooked up and installed correctly right the first time, and should have been all long been running? You've got some old equipment in there, so I don't know what has failed and uh, what has not been timed. Okay. The one we found, uh, uh, there was a program that was set into the Crestview one and it, it was a good idea, but there were some, some things in it that caused us to drop out. Hmm. So at times you would have it in there. Because I can tell you as a public safety person with the uh, county and the city, there's been multiple 
uh, questions of why those timings are not working, and now you're telling me that it never, it, 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 the system failed. All I can tell you is that when we were in the cabinet, it wasn't working. Okay. Now, I don't know if it went out the week before or if it never got hooked up or what. Hmm. But what we'll put in there will be uh, clock controlled. You know, we, it, who controls that? The, our department or is that WISDA? MnDOT controls those two ramp signals and the city controls the rest. Now, it might have been somebody when they hooked up the ramp signals and, and did that, they might have just disconnected everything. I think that what you had is a combination of hard wire and maybe radio. I didn't go in the cabinets. It's, we got a guy that, sure. that knows them. So obviously we have an issue to address up there in regards to that. Yeah, whether or not we do anything. it works, we're gonna get your existing system working. Well, I wish we would have known that at some other point in time, like three, five years ago, five, six years ago. But thank you for finding that. My second question is, on the north end of Carmichael, you didn't really bring up any information at Vine and Carmichael past uh, the middle school. Was there any information of the adequacy up there besides the two lanes both ways? We have some volumes to the north. You know, we went up uh, to the north side of the Vine intersection with volumes. And like I pointed out, we think there might be something in our numbers that isn't quite right. And once we get that corrected, then we'll be able to look further north and say, okay, of that five or 7,000 that's up there, how much is gonna end up going all the way around past the school and out on A or? Did you anticipate the development of the old Atwood property there on the corner of Vine and Carmichael to the south? Yes, that's, that was one of the development areas that showed up in there. We have uh, a development area on the west side from Vine south to Culver's. Yes. We have uh, two areas on the east side. One, run, one runs through the church and leaves the church, but runs down to about Hillcrest. And that is basically, that shows up on the land use map, is basically some, resi uh, some commercial and multiple family. So did in fact, did that intersection of Vine and Carmichael is it sufficient enough for the development and future development? I think if we pointed out that you're gonna to have to do some work both on the road, uh, on, on the lanes, the number of lanes right. from Walgreens North and at the intersection to develop right, left and through movements that are adequate for the traffic. Okay, thank you. Uh, following up on Randy's question about what, what's the timing on getting these control systems working together? Ballpark, one year, two years, is something. Oh, you mean a coordination system? Right. This spring. And then uh, I didn't get the sense that there was any consideration given to development further south of the city. And I think that at least there's some thought about that potential. Well, we, we went south. If you go south past or, and look at the west side of where the St. Croix, Croix Meadows is, you know, that's showing up on your land use map as institutional. Right. And so that's not gonna generate much traffic. Further south, you're out beyond uh, sewer water utilities, and we put uh, some housing in there on two acres just to see what it would, would do. And then we looked at the number for just the background growth, and it could be absorbed into that. So we took that into account. Now, if somebody came in and, and bought uh, the institutional property down there and said, so I'm going to put in uh, uh, 600 units of multifamily, then we'd have to go down and put that into the forecast also. So all we have down there is uh, the institutional use. To what does that mean? The institutional use is a uh, the camp YMCA camp, okay. et cetera. Right. That's camp St. Which is low volume, essentially. Yeah. Um, the other question I have is, what kind of volumes are we anticipating from the uh, development of the dog track? I, I remember the presentations talking about two and 3,000 employees. So I'm not sure that that number's really been reflected in these numbers. Oh yeah. That's, that's uh, my question. 
I think the numbers that we came that came out of there after all of the adjustments was around eleven thousand a day. Employees. No, eleven thousand trips. Oh, eleven thousand. Yeah. Okay, so and that I includes. Thought you, the, thought you said thousand. No. I said, okay. Eleven thousand right. trips, and that includes uh, the full development, all three buildings, the ballpark, um, Good. the restaurant, all that. When uh, we commented on those uses, I. I I think we said those uses are very specific and that's the use we put into and worked with the developer on so that we came up with those numbers. Yeah. If you change those uses to something more intense, then you have to figure you're gonna get more traffic out of it. No, that's the best information we have, so. Anybody else? What's the next step? I have a question. Uh, you want to? If it's okay. Yeah, come on up, identify yourself, please, sure. and give your address. Excuse me. Uh, my name is Mike Bruske. I live in the Northeast Quadrant that Glenn was talking about. Um, it seems like Glenn is the guy tonight who has the closest thing to a crystal ball here that I've seen so far. So I'm just curious, like, what's the latest, Glenn, in your predictions? What's going to happen with that Northeast Quadrant? We've heard you know, Walmart, Target for years and years, but I know the uh, redo of the uh, freeway ramps has probably changed that. So, and I'm also wondering if that's, you know, in your study, how much weight was given to that eventual. So, thank you. What we used in the Northwest Quadrant was the existing residential use. We did not put a Walmart in there, uh, even though we have some numbers from what a Walmart would generate. There's also could be, uh, could show some higher density. We've, we put that into the after 2025, just because we know there are some pretty high numbers and nobody really, ha I don't have a crystal ball. I don't, know, I don't know where he thought I got one from. <laughs> There's a fish bowl I got in my home. <laughs> but uh, we don't know what's gonna happen up there and so we didn't put anything in because we didn't want to reflect something that might not show up. But whatever it is, just like Councilman Weber said, whatever you put in there is going to add traffic, and then you're going to have to add, add, to add that to the existing or to the volume that we have in here. But we put that in after 2025. We, we did two trip generation studies for that. One was with um, a more dense residential, and the other one was with a Walmart. And so we have the numbers that come out, we just have to plug them in. And we chose not to plug them in in that quadrant just because it was such an unsettled issue. And I think we're glad we didn't put it in just because of what happened when, with the traffic we had from all the other sources. But when we did the work with the state, the state did the work with us on, on the Carmichael intersection, the 2025 was based on, as I remember the conversation, is when when we can't get traffic up the, the ramp is 2025 and that's when it has to get fixed that and that was their concern they, they don't care about the rest of it it's if they can't get traffic off of 94 then it's a problem it sounds like we might be there sooner than 2025 is that so will that be part of our conversation with the state that'll be part of their conversation with us <laughs> so you're going to take them some new numbers showing a different pattern is what I'd like to do is, is we're to, going to, I guess. Yeah, uh, what I would prefer to do is try and go back and see what we can do with the numbers, get get some more uh, clarity to options, and definitely recheck some of the numbers so that when they check our numbers, they won't say, "Whoops, we we don't want any whoopses in there." And then uh, we'd want to make sure that the city was comfortable with what we had and take that to them. We know that they, they have a, a genuine concern about any off-ramp. I mean, we dealt with them in an interchange in Altoona, and that was the first question they ever asked is, what's our off-ramp? And they want to get them off. They don't mind having them on the ramp. They just don't want them backed up to where they might get off. So we, had a, we didn't guarantee we can't in the traffic business. But we had to show them that given all of the conditions under some of the worst circumstances, it would not back out onto their freeway. And then they were pretty happy. Quickly, Glenn, I don't know if it's the same question, but did you say, wouldn't we as 
as a city, have you guys charged with the idea that we would want to plan for the future? And knowing that that quadrant of the Carmichael Road will be developed, why wouldn't you plug those numbers in? Partially because we're trying, we, we got a 2025 and a 2040 time period. Yeah. So we put in what we thought was going to occur definitely by 2025, which was the St. Croix and the Carmichael Ridges and a few other developments. We put part of the area to the north in there, but not 100% of it, trying to realistically figure what 2025 would be because if we dumped everything in and said it's going to be there in 2025, then you would really be under the gun. Then you have to start to look at what do we pull out. If we put in 2025 and not, not include the Walmarts or whatever might go in up there, because we don't know that they're, they're even interested anymore, as the gentleman said, because of the ramp inclusion. So we, we, we just made a decision that we had enough traffic without it and we'd see what happened. And this is what happened. But we, we're also trying to plan for the future, like you say. Right. I, just, I would still enter those numbers. We would want to see those numbers. And why wouldn't we make it available, design it to handle the future? Mm -hmm. And we all know it's going to be uh, probably uh, developed sooner than later. Well, we can... We can enter in more traffic at any time. That's the benefit of having this as a computer program. But when it gets to actual construction phase, we want to know that oh, yes. for future planning. I, I think uh, part of it is how much, how much of an improvement can we make on this to get it to work by 2025? Mm -hmm. If we can't get that to work by 2025, then we're going to have some real problems if we add more. Mm -hmm. If we can get it to work, then we can put some more increments in to see you know, what, what's going to take it over the top the next time? It might be that you, you just can't develop everything you want in the interchange area. I mean, we, we, we're engineers, but we're not magicians. We can't... We no, can't no I appreciate here. that, Glenn, but we also have to try to anticipate the future development. And right. It's a lot easier to swallow the, a cheaper thing than it would be down the road. So let's develop it now, and once we get the physical construction, we know where we're going to be. Okay. The thing that we would probably want to do before we went there is to see how much, we, how well we could get 2025 to work. Mm -hmm. And we're, we have to make some improvements to get to work. Then we'd probably use that same model, the same ramps and lanes and everything, and, and put the 2040 in, which would include the northeast quadrant and 100 percent of all the other development and the background <coughs> growth uh, for the, that other 15 years and then you can see how that works okay. so we're not saying we just quit at 2025 we're saying we've got a problem in 2025 let's try to resolve that because if we can't then why even look at 2040 we got to look at something different to get the volumes to work for 2025. Okay. so it's two edged one is we can do so much and when we're there then you we can't just keep putting more onto it it's like a, a drainage ditch. Right. You only put so much in it. You can dig it a little deeper, but eventually you're, you're at capacity. All right. Thanks. One of the uh, issues that we had with the Carmichael interchange was trying to figure out how to get, uh, make that bike and pedestrian friendly in any way. It's only, we only have two ways to get across the interstate, and that's 11th Street or, or, or Carmichael. Is there any thought, has there any thought been given or could would it be possible to look at a, all, some, some major alternatives like building a bridge, a separate ped bike bridge across the road? You see a lot of that in the cities, uh -huh. in these, these busy inter, 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 interchanges. Don't try to, don't try to, and you don't have to mess with your lights, you don't have to have walk signals. You know, it really change, could really change the traffic flow. So that, that uh -huh. and that's, that's, those are not cheap but it may really solve some problems if we looked at it that way. We did, one of the original sketches that we had out of the comp plan was to add a second bridge, which would basically run from the rest area across and tie into Ward, Ward, Ward Avenue north of Target. And uh, it's close enough so it should be a good alternate. It would pick up a lot of that local traffic that we saw. Uh, we did that also with a split diamond and we did a number of those and uh, that's one of the things that prompted them to, to them be in the WISDA to go and do the origin destination study and there's a sheet in their study that says this is what happens when we put in a second bridge for local traffic and they only got 15 percent of the traffic off uh, so they said they're not going to consider it anymore 
Yeah, well, I'm thinking not not for not for tr car traffic, but get the bike ped stuff away from from Carmichael. The Carmichael interchange it will simplify that interchange a lot if we don't oh. have to set up to have people walking and biking. Yeah. And we see them. I see. It just scares the heck out of me to see junior high kids or younger riding their bikes across there. One of the things they did under the, <coughs> one of the things they did in the new plan is they put in a a bike path along the entire west side of the interchange and it's got some specific crossings so it's better than what you got now but you're still crossing a lot of traffic yeah there's still a lot of lanes that, and people when they're <laughs> so they don't look you know the cars do not look when they're making a, yeah. a right hand turn but one of the things uh, that i uh, i won't say the that wisdom would say but i would guess that they would say is sure you can put it in and you can pay for it and then you're going to have to come up with the trail system to get them over there and come up with some way of blocking them from using Carmichael. I mean, I've, we've, put in, we've seen pedestrian bridges in uh, one in Golden Valley where about the only good they are is they provide shade for all the kids that are crossing underneath them. <laughs> I mean, they, they don't always work that great, so you've got to push them over to it. Even once in St. Paul in 94, kids have gone down, run down a hill and jumped and jumped and ran back up rather than walk across. Yeah, there's some so of that. it's, but that, that's that's worst case, and I don't think yeah. it is the worst I case. I've, I've never seen that ever in my travels around the cities. I'm, I've never seen that happen. But I have. if you if you put dedicated bike ped bridges in place with adequate paths, it'll work a lot better than if you're just hacking things around. I'm not saying it won't work. I'm saying yeah. it's going to work at your cost. That would be my guess. <laughs> well, maybe it's a negotiation with them. If we make the if we make the Carmichael interchange cheaper because they don't have to mess with that and traffic flows better, then there's some negotiation there. Yeah. I don't think we should assume that we're gonna, that we can't work with them on this. Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say don't, don't look at it. I'm, I'm just saying you have to go at it with an attitude of where's the money. Yeah. The other piece would be then looking at bike ped on, on uh, Carmichael all the way up to the junior high, the elementary, the Grandview Park. There's a significant amount of, of uh, attraction for having people walking and people biking to, to there. So is, is, that, is that part of the plan? Do you see that working? How do you see that working uh, with the, the well, we've done What we've done in our studies is gone to the St. Corey County plan that was just, in, just agreed to and used that as our base for just about any, anything, Hanley Road, whatever, because that was pretty comprehensive. I think the city has a plan that they're working on or some group within the city has a plan and and uh, I don't know what the status of that is but that's where that would would have to go to into your citywide plan uh, I don't disagree with it. it anytime we put in a sidewalk or a trail and where nobody's even been all of a sudden we have people on it we just did one on New, uh, New Richmond on 4th never saw a pedestrian on 4th and all of a sudden they're using the trail we put in Marion you have a comment yeah. Marion Weber, 604 Grandview Drive. In many ways, as I was listening to this, it feels like um, I feel like a pedestrian being held captive because I have to get in a car to get safely, reasonably safety from one place to another. Uh, the county plan is a, is a loose plan of connecting with specific trail plan within the county. It doesn't include or pretend to tell Hudson how to develop within bicycle pathways within Hudson. And I don't believe Carmichael and the Vine, Carmichael and Vine interchange is part of the county plan. It certainly is an issue with Hudson. It is. There are dozens and, and maybe tens of dozens of uh, school children who cross that area on a regular basis. It's highly used by bicyclists. And all kinds of people are walking along there. It's a pedestrian area. Uh, uh, neighborhood. It's a neighborhood. And a lot of families and people are on that, unfortunately, on Carmichael and Vine Street up in that area. Um, this, it's a transportation project, but it's not just transportation for cars. And if it were a car as a vehicle, a bicycle as a vehicle. I just don't want this to turn into a project that minimizes my access to be able to walk or ride my bike to the movie or to the grocery store or to a restaurant because it's being designed to, to um, 
emphasize the convenience of high vehicles traveling at a high speed to access Hudson to drive in and out and around and not necessarily even to stay. Um, I think what you're interested in the transportation plan is getting people from one place in Hudson to another and to encourage them to stay and spend some time. I don't think it's to whiz around. Uh, that area is not just an area that, that is a connection with businesses and, and hospitals and restaurants and banks and grocery stores. It's also a connection to people's homes and it's about getting people safely within Hudson, not just up and down the Highway 95 Poor Corridor, to be able to travel safely from one place to another and to be able to have options about how they do it. And I know that traditionally cars have been the way you do this, maybe motorcycles because that's sort of popular now. I would just reiterate that bicycles are vehicles. They have all the same rules of the road that they have to follow that a car has to follow. They have as much right to be on those roads unless it's a super highway that's restricted to restricted access. They are welcome to be on the roads and they are to be just the idea is that they're designed to accommodate bicyclists as well as cars, as vehicles. In addition, there's no reason why people have to feel threatened when they walk along these roads. There should be accommodations to make it safe for everyone. And uh, as you're talking, and I don't think that you're totally discounting uh, me from being able to use those pathways in any way I choose that's safe, I, but I feel restricted to being, being told that the way that I need to be doing this is a, in a car if I want to feel safe. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, Doug Rowan, 295 Riverview Drive. I also represent in um, this position the Riverview Drive Homeowners Association. Um, we are on one of the major intersections with Carmichael Road that right now is already a significantly da dangerous intersection with the changes with the ballpark and the increased traffic to the YMCA day camp as they increase their utilization of their new facility. We see even more traffic going through that particular intersection, which has already had some dangerous outcomes. Um, my understanding, I understand the primary objective of this project is probably to figure out what to do with the 94 Carmichael intersection, because mm -hmm. um, that will be a huge investment no matter how that's resolved. But the other intersections to the south are also important. From the presentation earlier, it sound like, sounds like the only undeveloped or vacant uh, land that was considered in the study was within the city of Hudson and ignores the town of Troy and other communities south that also use this corridor on a regular basis. And I think both in the short term and long term plans, it would be helpful to get that included in the study um, because I think for sure on maybe not, may not have a significant impact on the I-94 Carmichael intersection, but on Albert Street and for sure Riverview Drive and Mayor Road, those intersections will also have huge impacts from the additional traffic from that development to the south and with the ballpark. And we've already had some significant issues um, at the Riverview Drive Carmichael intersection. We'd like to avoid those in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, when we started talking about the study, we wanted to go, the reason we made it go from north to south limits was that we knew there was going to be a lot of impact from all this development. And Hudson has a, a pedestrian rating of 9 out of 100. We're not very pedestrian friendly. So um, I think just trying to get out ahead of this and think uh, in terms of not only what kind of impacts would be on Carmichael, but what kind of money impacts are going to come, not only from the interchange, but are we going to make it four lane all the way to Vine or not? Or, you know, we haven't really talked about that either. So. And there are planned signals for the new the dog track development, aren't there? Yeah. Right. If I can make two comments <coughs> to respond. Sure. Um, we, when the St. Croix Meadows came in, they proposed some access out to, kind, to connect to Riversview Drive. And that will be, a, at their cost, a total new intersection with median left turn lanes, et cetera. So that we didn't ignore it. It's there. It was analyzed as part of the traffic analysis for 
St. Croix Meadows. The same way with uh, Meyer Road, Mayor Road, and with Albert Street. And we did some changes at Albert Street to make sure that none of that traffic from St. Croix Meadows gets into that neighborhood. So we haven't ignored it. It's just not part of this part of the study. Right. In the same way to the north. And the second thing is we did look at the, the growth in Troy Township and at the outside. We call them the out, outlying areas. And if we saw a potential for large development, we put it in. I, I think we did one for a little further to, the, well, the stuff up north we did. <coughs> Some of that also can be put into what we call that background growth. So it's there, we accounted for it, we just didn't spell it out as a specific development. It's included in the background growth and that's where the background growth comes from. So he's right, uh, except that we did do both of the things he asked us about. I think that's probably the, the one assumption that you've mentioned that I would disagree with in that I expect Hudson to develop to the south, not the town of Troy. So that's, I think that's what we need to look at it from that perspective, that the, maybe the next half mile out is gonna be someday going right down County Road F could be Hudson. So we, we, you know, that's 2040, certainly possible by then, 2025 even. So we need the, you know, we need the, that's just like the Northeast Quadrant to me, not, not including that, that this we ought to look at. And here's, you know, maybe it's only a 50% potential but it's a, it is significant. It, if it happens, it could kill us. You know, it's another, what, what, what's a 10, 10 trips per house? Get 200 houses, that's 2, 000, another 2,000 trips. You know, we're, uh -huh. we're marginal as, with some of this as we are. Well, with the way the models are developed, you can, you can show where the breaking point's gonna happen. You, you can add more numbers until it breaks and say, well, we can handle another 50,000 people to the yeah. south or not, so. Good information. I mean, it sounds like the way after we're done with this, we'll be able to just tweak it and find out where it's gonna break, even the, even the intersection of the preferred option, so. And then we can decide whether that's realistic or not. Yeah. I think the, the thing we're trying to do is get out front and tell you that you have some problems and we gotta solve those problems before we start putting the additional traffic loads on it and then say, whoops. That's, you know, why we, that's, that's why we wanted to do the study. Pardon? That's why we wanted to do the study. We could see it coming. We, we have issues now and we know it's gonna get worse. And that's why we wanted to come and have a meeting with you and say this is where we're at and this is what we found and how, you know, how do you want us to continue on? And I think we've got some direction. But you know, there is a point where we can't continue to add lanes and do things. Okay, everybody good? Thanks, Glenn. Sorry, I went longer than the finance committee. Way longer. <laughs> this is huge. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Glenn. Uh, all right. Let's see how Scott can do here. Honorable Mayor, Common Council Members. Uh, Brian's kind of setting up the video. Um, last year, we looked at getting an informational video about the fire department, and uh, Rick and Marianne Wald of Studio One Productions offered to do it, and they did it free of charge. And with the help of Captain Brian Schmidt, they put a lot of time into it. And so I wanted to share it with the, the council, and also it's a time that we have openings for firefighters. So if people are out there interested in getting, joining the fire department, they can go to the city's website or stop by City Hall. I believe it closes January 26th. And we, um, you don't, do not have to have uh, experience in firefighting. But anyway, again, I'd like to thank the Walds for putting this video together and hopefully you'll find it informational. And uh, if you do wanna use it for any civic events or something, feel free to contact us and we can get, lend you a copy. So, Brian.
Can we kill these front lights? We also have an explorer's post that is run in conjunction with the Boy Scouts of America. The firefighters respond to calls from their home, work, family events, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. They, they don't get involved uh, in any kind of uh, public service with the idea of making money. I think uh, it, it's, uh, it's something that uh, is satisfying and knowing that you're doing something for people you, you live with. I, uh, I like being involved and I enjoy working with the other people who have uh, you know, that same drive and determination to do something for the community. It, it is a feeling of uh, um, going into any kind of fire. You rely on your training. But you are so isolated from everything around you because of the equipment you wear, uh, the self-contained breathing apparatus, helmets, everything else. It's, it becomes a surreal environment. Uh, the only thing that you really can rely on is your training, but then knowing that the people that you work with have the same training and that uh, you're there to support each other. So in the end, where it might seem that you're by yourself and in a very hostile environment, you know you're going into that situation with uh, somebody that uh, is looking out for your welfare and you're doing the same for them. It's more probably for me than a lot of people. We've got several individuals who are multi-generational members and I think uh, the connection for us might be a little different than some of the other members, but uh, just because of the family connection. But uh, I think we all have the same ideas in mind for the same reason. It, it, uh, this is a family for me and I think it is for most of us. The family depth connection for me is is ultra important. You know, that's one of the big keys that drives me to do what I do and to continue to do it uh, after 40 years. Uh, kind of like really proud of being in a family that's in community service and being able to help out the community and giving back and like having my whole family here. Like they don't look at me as just an explorer. They're trying to teach me and help me along the way. They don't push me aside or anything. They're always telling me to like come up and help them. Yeah, I've been here since I was 15. I mean, I've been here for about four years, I think. And I've been here when I was little, and I kind of like grew up with everyone, so everyone's family now. I don't like play on anything. I think it's made me a little stronger person. I've always been really shy, and then being here, being put in this work group, and being put more as a leader, and I've stepped up more and come out of my bubble, and more of a leader now. Uh, well, I, I uh, moved here uh, in 1986, and when my wife and my first one uh, moved here in 87. And uh, since my father was, uh, civil defense firefighter back home and you know we always went and watched their you know doing practices and things like that and it's kind of like something in my in my heart I think and also my friend's dad was a career firefighter and you he always heard the fire alarm go off you know in uh, the department <coughs> and, uh, so it's kind of I think it's more of the side of the serving where I, you know, come in, I think. It's uh, to help the people in need or, or you, know, you know, protect. Yeah, I, I'm proud of my military background, I am. And, and uh, 
I served under Kong Hu Lao, the fifth, that uh, was the people's king. And um, yeah, that was that was just amazing. And uh, I never gonna forget that time. You know, it, it was an awesome uh, experience. And I believe that everybody should have the you know the experience in serving their country in some form or matter, you know, in military or or you know, fire police, you know, National Guard, anything like that. You you get a little bit of a different feel for for your country and, and your flag. The Hudson Fire Department currently handles about 450 calls a year that vary from active fire alarms, accidents, technical rescue, assist on medical, hazmat incidents, and active fires. The drowning person in the St. Croix River in the springtime is the only gentleman that was fishing in the canoe and kept over, and, and I was uh, the one to, to get him. I went beyond my duty a little bit. I was supposed to be, you know, for safety. I wasn't that safe. I didn't, I didn't have a lifeline. But this guy was going down and he was going down fast. And I, with my fitness, I thought, mm, I can handle this. And, you know, cold water and stuff, I don't matter. We had a suit on, but we uh, saved this one guy's uh, life. And, uh, you know, with uh, all the people in the, the, on the department who ran the same doors was one I was supposed to be at that time. And that's the thing that I remember most, and of course, some fires and car accidents that it's deeply, uh, you know, started in my, in my mind. We're kind of at the mercy of our failures. Uh, holidays, family functions, Baby goes off, we gotta go. I think everyone kinda knows that when they're signing up to be on the fire department and it's something that you wish you got to spend more time with your family, but it, it is a, a job that is known that you're probably gonna be gone for a lot of those few minutes. Yeah, well my family, you know, they come to adjust. And, um, I guess uh, as far as being rewarded, it's, it's it, it, in the past years when I've driven in parades and so forth, uh, to see the public come out and, uh, and really be in the kids and be excited about the fire truck. And now it's my grandkids. I bring them down and show them fire trucks and, and uh, take them for riding trucks. And uh, there's a lot of pride in this, in this fire truck. It is. And I think uh, the community has appreciated this. For myself now, um, I don't really now throw on an air pack anymore and go in the burning buildings. I am 66 years old, although I've stayed in fairly decent shape all the years. But there are other jobs for me to do. And one of the things that I'm, I can do and I'm good at is driving the trucks. And uh, that's a big responsibility when you come onto the scene. So, um, and that's something I can do. And as far as the physical aspect of it, uh, most of the jobs I can still do. And everybody has to pitch in, especially when things start going bad. Um, and again, uh, a young person coming on, if they work hard, they're going to earn their respect to the elders. And uh, they're going to enjoy the fire service. It's, it's the dedicated firefighters and explorers that that is the, the strength. I mean, we, we have some of the highest trained firefighters around, the dedication, um, you know, they're coming in on weekends and nights for trainings and, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that runs. Um, if they're up all night, they still have to go into their, you know, normal jobs. So by far, it's, you know, and the, and the dedication really reflects because of the fact that we do have these somewhat substandard situation now with the fire station. We have our equipment's kind of spread throughout the city, um, and yet they still kind of thrive and still come in and dedicate them, and, you know, even if these conditions still continue to do a top shelf job. So that's by far the strength of the fire department. 
Um, we're also fortunate to have the support of the city that continues to support us with our equipment. And uh, across the nation, um, it's really an epidemic of shortage volunteers. Fortunately here, we've been able to staff and have a waiting list um, for, for quite a few years, and we still have that now. Um, I think part of it is because the quality of the firefighters we have, and we have a really good group of people, um, have good equipment, and, and the fire department over the years, they've had just a great reputation. So we're very fortunate. We're in the, definitely in the minority. Um, my goal is to continue to keep the same model of, of the paid on call volunteers as long as we can. And at this rate, I'm, I'm expecting we can do that, and that's my hope is to continue to service the community um, with top-notch service at a, you know, economically <coughs> to do it. Um, and like I said, as long as we continue to be dedicated firefighters and we continue to get people involved, um, we have a great explore program that's kind of a, somewhat of a feeder system that we can get people from that too. The kids start in high school and they get trained and then uh, we have four of them on the fire department right now. Um, that's really a nice program. So we'll continue to look at other avenues to, to get people, but hopefully, um, other than the, the physical facilities, it doesn't look a whole lot different than how we provide our service time as you know. Thank you for uh, the time and watching. I know you had a busy night, but uh, thanks again. And thanks again to the council and the mayor for the support uh, you've given me over the last three and a half years. So thanks again. Thanks, Scott. Nicely done. <coughs> nice, Brian. All right, uh, discussion of possible action on approval of Class B beer and Class C wine license application from Cat Junction, LLC, doing business as Urban Olive and Vine, Carol Trainer agent. Move to approve. Second. And a motion second to approve. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Discussion possible action to set bond amount for drone violation ordinance. You should have a revised issue sheet on uh, uh, the table in front of you. It sets uh, what the ordinance does. It refers back to the general uh, penalty in the beginning of the Hudson Code, and there's a first offense and second offense. And I think the council gave direction for first offense around the 200 mark, um, including the court costs, and that's where you get the 218.50. And then um, Judge Garrity, I asked her to also provide a um, bond for second offense because that's included in the ordinance. And she said the, two eight, the second offense totals 281.50 and that's consistent um, with her other um, similar second offense bond schedule for other similar offenses. So she's, these are her recommendations. They're subject to council approval, and she's asking for council approval. Okay. I'll move we approve. You don't need a suspension? It's just a bond. Uh, uh, no, this is just the bond okay. schedule. Right. They can be changed at any time, right? Just okay. motion. Second. Motion and second to approve. Discussion? Uh, so if I see a drone and I, they're doing things inappropriately, I call the police? Yes. That? That, okay. Slingshot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole private property thing right you don't want to do that <laughs> yeah it's invasion i mean our ordinance is designed to get at the invasion of privacy type use of drones <laughs> but to your point we don't <laughs> no self-help yeah you said originally though that then the owner could take it up with you because it, it would be subject to me breaking somebody's drone some drones are very expensive so you know I don't think, anyway, all right. Yeah, no, if you're concerned about a violation of the ordinance, someone should contact the police department. Got it. Thank you. Anybody else? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Uh, I don't have any, oh, we've got uh, the appointment. Yep. yep, discussion of possible action on appointment of John Tremble to the St. Croix EMS Ad Hoc Committee. Are you making the appointment? Yes. And then you need a uh, move. Approval. To, move to approve. Okay. <laughs> okay. Second. Yeah, motion second to approve. Any discussion? All those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's approved. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, communications, uh, I've got nothing. Anything for future agendas? Unless you know, uh, could we get an update on the population census for liquor license availabilities? If that changed or It won't up? change until we hit 14,000. So we have- Well, the moment. earliest potential would be next October. Oh. Is this October or next October? I, October 18 or 18, 19. 19. Okay. okay. I still think it's October too. Okay. So the, we would know in August, becomes official in October, we'd have to hit 14,001. So we haven't hit it, so there's nothing available? Nothing available. Nothing available. Okay. So we'd have to get 257 more, which I don't know how the state does their number. They look at building permits, they look at um, vehicles registered. Mm -hmm. That's the way they kind of figure out how many more people now with Carmichael Ridge, mm -hmm. I, we issued what, 80, 90, uh, single family residence permits in there, plus some, there's been some multifamily going up too. So, All right. I don't know. We went up by a couple hundred this year, but. Like what, 13,000, seven? 70, 774 is where we're at, so I think we're at. So need to say we need to stay on top of our state legislators yep. to move forward with more? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So essentially it's every 500 people. Okay. That's what the. Okay, anybody else? I've got nothing. Anybody? Kathy? No. Anything? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. You, anybody that's interested, there, we do have absentee voting this week until Friday at 5 p.m. Correct. Special election is next Tuesday. Regular polling places, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. There will be a February primary because we haven't had enough elections. Um, that'll only be the sp state Supreme Court. That's the only item that'll be on for the city of Hudson residents. But there will be a primary in February as well, which is the... 21st. Okay. All right. Uh, discussion possible action on entering into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statutes 19.85 sub 1 sub E, deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session regarding. Possible amendment to the exclusive negotiating rights agreement regarding city property at 221 Commercial Street and 418 Second Street and other properties in the city. No move to go into closed session. Second. second. Got a motion and second. Roll call. I'm sorry. Uh, Morissette. Yes. Alms. Yes. McCormick. Yes. Cover. Yes. Target. Yes. Paul. Yes. Motion's approved. We're in closed session. We're live? All right. Anybody motion? I'll um, move to approve that the council approve the first amendment to exclusive negotiating rights agreement discussed in closed session. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's approved. Do we have a motion? Move to adjourn. Second. Got a motion, second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. We stand adjourned.